To be a New Testament Christian meant having fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and being in the church and belonging to an actual Christian fellowship. is taken from Acts chapter 2 verses 36 to 47. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them. And he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, 
they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. As we stand, let's pray together. Father, speak to us from your word and change us by your spirit, not just individually, but also as a church. For Jesus' sake, amen. Please have a seat and do open up Acts chapter 2 and verses 36 to 47. And that's on page 1094 of the church Bibles. Our topic this evening is fellowship and the church and the space to make notes on the back of your service sheets. The author, Stephen King, once said rather typically, I'm not a vampire type when somebody shows me the cross, but organized religion gives me the creeps. And some people tell me, Jonathan, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Their faith is something very individualistic. It's between me and my God, they say. But that bears no relationship to New Testament Christianity at all. To be a New Testament Christian meant having fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And being in the church and belonging 
to an actual Christian fellowship. Have a look at verse 42. They, the 3,120 believers in Jerusalem, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Yes, we do become Christians individually, even when we do so as part of a large crowd who respond to the gospel. Have a look at verses 37 and 38. After hearing Peter's sermon about Jesus Christ, the people were cut to the heart. In other words, they were convicted of their sin and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So turning to Jesus as Lord and trusting Him as Savior is an individual matter. But what then? Well, have a look at verses 41 and 42. Those who accepted his message individually were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They corporately devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. After individually accepting Peter's gospel message, And then being baptized, notice that from then on, verses 42 through verse 47, Luke writes this, they, they, they. The church grew rapidly and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. All the believers were together. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We turn to Jesus Christ individually to live for Jesus corporately. In other words, together as God's family. Being a Christian is not just about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't belong to a church. And as 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 puts it for all believers here tonight, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And let's not forget that God planned the church. Christ gave himself For the church, that's Ephesians 5 verse 25, the Holy Spirit is building us together in the church. That's 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. We are to be ready to give our lives for the building of God's church, whether here or across the world. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He is building his church. And we are to play our part, equipped with at least one gift given by the Holy Spirit for the building up of the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. You see, what is the aim of all missionary work? And indeed, all Christian work. It's not merely to harvest the unharvested field, but also to build the uncompleted building. So to have nothing to do with the Lord's church is to reject God's plan, mission, and building project. And as we glimpse here in Acts, the church is not a third-class waiting room where we twiddle our thumbs while we wait for first-class accommodation in heaven. It's meant to be a dynamic new community, winsome and attractive, and with an eternal significance in the purposes of God. It is the body of Christ, 
and the bride of Christ, we are not to take it lightly. And part of its dynamism is that it grows in numbers and in maturity. The first church here in Acts chapter 2 was a mega church. It was over 3,000 in size and was growing daily. A spirit-filled church is alive. And what are the marks of the Spirit's presence in the church and our fellowship? Well, according to Acts chapter 2, they are these. Biblical teaching, loving fellowship, sacrificial giving, living worship, and an ongoing and outgoing evangelism. So what does God's new society look like in action? Well, first, the church is for teaching the Bible, and you need that teaching. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You see, a spirit-filled church is where you can devote yourself to and receive the apostles' teaching. The first thing they did was to devote themselves to that apostles' teaching. And devote is a strong word. It meant they spent time doing it. They were eager to learn and to discover God's truth. They wanted to learn from the apostles. And that is a mark of being spirit-filled. But some of you might be saying, why be devoted to the apostles' teaching now in 2008? Well, one reason is given here. In verse 43, many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. God confirmed the teaching of the apostles by miracles. The apostles raised the dead and were involved in remarkable instantaneous healings. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 speaks of the things that mark an apostle. Signs, wonders and miracles. And if they were the marks of an apostle, they set the apostles apart. What they did was not what other Christians did. And that was the way God authenticated their teaching. Also, of course, the apostles were commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. And they'd met him, risen from the dead. Today, their teaching in its authentic form is in the New Testament. And the New Testament endorses the Old Testament. So you get the apostles' teaching today in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so a spirit-filled church is a biblical church. It's where the Bible is taught. And that's why you need to belong to a church that teaches the Bible. Secondly, the church is for fellowship, and you need Christian fellowship. Look at verses 42, 44, and 45. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. All the believers were together and had everything in common. <coughs> Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. They also devoted themselves to the fellowship. What does that mean? Well, it means to be committed to each other as we are to Jesus Christ. How did they show that according to these verses? Well, the church is where practical needs are met. In the early days of the church, meeting members' financial needs was very high on the agenda. But this is not primitive communism. Verse 44 literally says that they were selling, they were giving. What happened was that as needs became known, someone who had an asset and wanted to help others financially sold it and used the proceeds to meet the need. And later on in Acts, you hear how someone sold a field. It was private stewardship, but with a recognition that material goods should be for the common good of the church. And that still should be the case. 
And this generosity of the early church was and still is a mark of a spirit-filled church. As a result, what did the outsiders say of the early believers? Well, they said, see how these Christians love one another. See how these Christians love one another. Tradition has it that when the Apostle Paul was, the Apostle John, sorry, was very old and so weak that he could no longer preach, he used to be carried into the church at Ephesus and give a brief message of just three words. Love one another. And when his hearers grew tired of his message and asked him why he repeated it so often, he would reply, because it is the Lord's command. And that practical, self-sacrificial love is so vital to our life and witness as a church. And perhaps even more so at this time of economic turmoil and uncertainty. However, there are other needs too. There's a need for mutual care and support. I once saw this sign on a church notice board. We care about you. Sundays, 10 a.m. only. <laughs> but a true church should care for one another even when it's inconvenient. Genuine Christian fellowship can supply those needs of mutual care and support. And today there are many people who are lonely, who are in need of what genuine Christian fellowship can offer. You see, there is a human as well as a spiritual value in the small groups and activities of the church. Scientific studies in the U.S. show that church services are actually good for the health. One rather wry survey on how to stay safe in the world said this. Number one, avoid riding in cars because they're responsible for 20% of all fatal accidents. Number two, do not stay at home because 17% of all accidents occur in the home. Number three, avoid walking because 14% of all accidents occur to pedestrians. Number four, avoid going by air, rail, or water, because 16% of all accidents occur there. Number five, of the remaining 33%, 32% of all deaths occur in hospitals. <laughs> Above all else, avoid hospitals. You'll be pleased to learn that only 0.001% of all deaths occur in church services. And these are usually related to previous physical problems. <laughs> Therefore, the safest place for you to be at any given point in time is the church. <laughs> the percentage of deaths during Bible study is even less. <laughs> so for safety's sake, attend church and read your Bible. It could save your life. But fellowship is not just about how you yourself can benefit. If you're going to be faithful to the apostles' teaching, you need to serve as well as be served. You need an environment where you can exercise gifts of service. And that is what the church provides. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, serve one another in love. And often that will be in humble ways, ways which are behind the scenes, such as serving in the uniform group, toddler groups, creches, and on the sidesmen, student supper, and all divisional teams. But all those are so vital. Take the PA and AV teams at the back of church tonight, for example. Now, I've got to be very careful what I say. They literally have the power to switch me off. But without them, many of us wouldn't be able to hear or see. Are you devoted to the apostles' teaching and fellowship here on a Sunday 
and in your small groups. If we're to be devoted, aren't we here twice on a Sunday? Even if you're a student, you could make it for 11.15. Perhaps serving in some particular way at one service and then coming to another. If you have to miss occasionally, then catch up through Clayton.tv or download the MP3. Do we make our small group a priority, come what may? You know, some of us can perhaps too easily think, they won't miss me if I don't go. But how can we put Acts chapter 2 into practice if we don't go? How can we obey the 50 one another's in the New Testament, such as love one another, encourage one another, care for one another, if we don't go? Church is not an optional extra. And as Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 makes very clear, this church grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. But as we work, we must also be devoted to prayer. So thirdly, the church is for corporate worship and prayer. And you need to praise God together and to pray together with others. You see, they also devoted themselves, verse 42, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. <coughs> it seems this is a reference to the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, as we're doing tonight. And to prayer services or meetings, not just private prayer. And it appears that they had both more formal and less formal times for meeting. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. They met both in the temple courts and in their homes. They had large gatherings in the temple courts, but they also met informally in their homes. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. And you see, you can't do that on your own. And they were praising God. And they prayed together. Are you devoted to prayer? Not just to private prayer, but to corporate prayer with other Christians. You see, if you're a true Christian, you will be praying with others. Such as at the central prayer meeting every other Wednesday here in the church hall. Now as a fellowship, we are very weak at this. Yonggi Cho, the leader of the largest local church in the world, with 850,000 members, said this, I've not followed a secret formula in the church growth we're experiencing. There's no question in my mind that what has been done in Korea can also be duplicated in every part of the world. The key is prayer. Fourthly and finally, the church is for evangelism. And you need to be involved in evangelism. It's been said that the church is the most extraordinary society in the world. The entrance free is nothing. The annual subscription is everything. And the society is being formed for the benefit of non-members. Yes, it's very important to have koinonia, fellowship. But it's very unhealthy to have koinonitis. You see, reaching those outside the church is a key priority. Verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Jesus commands his disciples to evangelize. But according to this verse, the church is necessary for that evangelism. You see, evangelism is not just about people making decisions. It's about making disciples, as Jesus commanded in Matthew 28. So when people profess faith, they need to be nurtured in the church. They need to be added to the church. So a healthy church is also a growing church. Because it's an evangelizing church. 
So how did evangelism work in the early church? Well, the witness of the church's life together was very powerful. And we see that mentioned in verse 47. But essentially, the believers preached the gospel as Peter had done back in verses 22 to 41. And that is still the great way the Holy Spirit brings people to faith in Christ today. So what did Peter preach? Well, have a look back at those verses, verses 22 to 41. Peter preached about Jesus, his death, resurrection, and ascension. Regarding the resurrection, Peter said this in verse 32. We are all witnesses to this fact. Now, some of you may still have questions about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But for Peter, an eyewitness, the resurrection of Jesus and therefore his death on the cross were absolute certainties. Recently, a few of us were in Rome and saw where Peter was martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. Why would he be prepared to die if he knew that Jesus' resurrection was a lie? He'd also witnessed Jesus' ascension. And now the crowd had also seen and heard the effect of Jesus pouring out the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, verse 36, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. All this wasn't just out of the blue. It had been foretold by the prophets, and we see that in verses 16 and 25. It was all part of God's plan for the world. Have a look at verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. This preaching of the gospel demanded a response. People knew it then. And people know it today when they hear gospel preaching. Look again at verses 37 and 38. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who tonight is cut to the heart? In other words, convicted of their sin. And asking, what do I need to do? Well, inwardly, you need to repent. That is, you need to turn from going your own way and ignoring God. In other words, from your sin. And you need to turn to Jesus Christ, who died for you, in your place, bearing your sin. And you do that inwardly by faith. But then you need an outward step. You need the outward profession of baptism. Or if you've already been baptized, you need to publicly renew your baptismal vows. And the next opportunity for that is on Sunday, November the 9th. And do see Jonathan Pryke about that if you want to get baptized or renew your vows. And the promise here in verse 38 is that if you repent and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you call on his name, verse 21, you'll be forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit who gives you new life. Why not turn to Jesus Christ tonight? So we're to play our part as a church, by preaching the gospel and by getting the gospel message out in new ways, such as through Clayton.tv, 
which has the potential to reach and encourage many millions. But it was the Lord, verse 47, who added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's why they needed to pray. And it's why we need to pray today. And these early Christians knew that when the Holy Spirit worked in someone's life, he brought them to belong to the church. They were added to their number. And notice, this happened daily. I wonder if we see evangelism as a daily activity. Are we taking daily opportunities to, to witness to Christ in the power of his Spirit? Who are we inviting, for example, to the invitation service here next Sunday evening? And to Christianity Explored? A survey was undertaken recently to ascertain the number of unchurched people who are receptive to attending church if invited and taken by a friend. What do you think the result was? 82%. 82%. Open your eyes, says Jesus Christ, and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. That's John chapter 4 and verse 35. You see, we are sent out from this communion service into the world as Christ's ambassadors. Michael Green once wrote, The Lord's Supper is battle rations for Christian warriors, not cream cake for Christian layabouts. Just imagine the potential of this church under Christ our head to build up, reach out, and help to change this region for Jesus Christ as we all devote ourselves to what the church is for. Let's pray together. And in a moment of quietness, let's respond to God's word. It may be that someone here tonight does want to turn to Christ for the first time and trust him as their saviour and lord perhaps for others of us it's recommitting ourselves to him and to his church the church that he died for lord in your mercy hear our prayer